CataractCoach.com. Welcome back to our podcast series. And today's podcast number two with Dr. Richard L. Lindstrom. Well, welcome, Dr. Lindstrom. This is our Cataract Coach podcast where we're talking to innovative leaders in ophthalmology and kind of doing a deeper dive. So it'll be a free-flowing conversation. But I want to just start off by telling you the first time I met you. I was a senior resident. The ASCRS in the year 2000 was in Boston. It was a big trip to go from Los Angeles to Boston, but I went with a a co-resident, and I saw you give a talk about how to do tilt and tumble, a FACO technique that you pioneered. And I was blown away because here I mistakenly thought that whatever I learned in residency would be it, and then I'd use that knowledge and go and practice, and I didn't realize there was a whole world out there. And so that got me thinking, and you know, after befriending you more than 20 years ago, what I really admired about you is that you're always at the forefront of the changes in ophthalmology, the evolution, the revolution, and the progression. And so how has, how has ophthalmology changed over the years? What's the general trend that you see from your expert eyes? Well, the good news is, is that our field, ophthalmology, continues to support uh, investment uh, and innovation, which uh, is wonderful for our patients and, and for us. Uh, Recently, uh, Raymond James did sort of a count, and according to them, there's 250 startups in ophthalmology right now. And so there's venture money and private equity money investing in ophthalmology. And when uh, both human and financial capital are invested in the field, then there are advances. And to me, that's, that's been fun from the beginning. I've always uh, been interested in new technology, adopting new techniques, and working with uh, industry to uh, advance the field. It's, to me, it's very admirable how you've always seemed to be at the very cutting edge, but you don't kind of realize that for every one company that really takes off, a couple others don't quite make it. So what's that like? Well, there's certainly, you know, been, been failures, and I guess the, uh, the, the largest graveyard for me has been trying to develop surgical techniques to treat presbyopia, uh, certainly over the last, uh, at last decade. We, you know, I was involved in refractec and conductive keratoplasty uh, that we commercialized and, and it didn't succeed. I was involved in developing the camera inlay that we, uh, you know, basically commercialized, it didn't succeed. And then, you know, several startups that never, you know, never even, even made it. So, so I would say, you know, not everyone, uh, not every uh, new technology, you know, succeeds and, and actually gets FDA approval. And even those that get FDA approval, not every uh, technology succeeds in the marketplace. Speaking of presbyopia, where do you think we're headed? Now that I hit the age of 50, now I actually believe presbyopia is real. Once it hit me. <laughs> it's real, it's real. Well, we've got three, uh, you know, alternatives other than glasses and contact lenses. Uh, and we have multifocal and progressive glasses and contact lenses, and we have monovision with optical correction. But on the other than optical correction side, we've got the pharmacologic treatment of refractive errors, and that today is meiotic uh, drops with one FDA-approved viewity and several on the way. Uh, We do have some corneal uh, refractive surgery approaches, uh, primarily monovision. Presbylasic is another one of those that I was involved in clinical trials on that never actually even got to FDA approval, but for some patients, monovision works extremely well. And I think the really growth opportunity is in refractive cataract surgery, if you will. Sure. Refractive lens-based surgery, refractive lens exchange, and that's uh, where we're seeing meaningful growth right now. For your average ophthalmologist, how do you keep up with so many different advances in the field? Do you ultra-specialize? Do you try to just cast a wide net? Well, I'm, I'm forced to a little bit. You know, this is my 40th year on the editorial board of Ocular Surgery News, and, and uh, I started as associate medical editor when it was founded 40 years ago with uh, Don Sanders as editor, and then I, uh, about 30 years ago, became editor. And uh, they make me or ask me to write a, a perspective or commentary on every feature article, so I've been doing that for 30 years. And it's in every field. Uh, and basically what I do is I, I, I do research and I, I look at, uh, uh, you know, what would be interesting to me that I didn't know and then I share it with my readers. That's one thing. The, the other thing is that the first 10 years of my practice, I was in a multi-specialty academic medical center. I was the director of the corneal service at the University of Minnesota and 
chief at the Minneapolis VA hospital, so we dealt with everything. And in my current practice, Minnesota Eye Consultants, we also have uh, every subspecialty. So I get to you know interact with my colleagues in every field as well. So those two things primarily, and then, of course, uh, some interaction uh, at meetings uh, sure. helps as well. So it really is a commitment, a commitment to lifelong learning, if you will. Yeah, that's right. When I, when I entered medical school, actually, I was somewhat close to the dean, and, uh, and the dean at that time, what he spoke about all the time is that medicine is uh, and requires lifelong learning. So it's exactly what you just said. It's, uh, it's never over. There's always going to be advances and innovations. Uh, you know, I, I, I first entered ophthalmology 50 years ago now, and so you know, in my residency, I was trained as an intracapsular cataract surgeon. We did use a, a microscope. My uh, program yeah. was, uh, was advanced as far as uh, using... Uh, you know, microsurgical approaches, but uh, what we do in every single field is is totally changed. We only do penetrating keratoplasty in those days in retina. There were no anti-VEGF, just uh, some early laser therapy for diabetic retinopathy. There was basically no treatment uh, for wet and dry AMD. So, you know, it's really uh, been huge advances that, that have occurred, and, and it's accelerating. So for the, the resident training today or the young ophthalmologists, uh, you know, these advancements are accelerating, and they're accelerating because, as I said, our field is uh, supporting investment. And when there's investment in your field, uh, you know, both human and financial capital, sure. then advancements occur. So, you know, cataract coach is really popular among the younger ophthalmologists, say age 30 to 50. So I think one thing I want to try to emphasize as to them is your residency and your fellowship are fantastic, but they're the foundation for the rest of your learning. Yes, well, you have to continue to add new things to your practice, and uh, um, it's a challenge, you know. So uh, in your residency, while well, you've got someone right there by your side, and, and usually uh, you're not maybe in some cases even taking care of your own personal patients, it's a different responsibility when you start sure. to adopt new technologies on your, on your own personal patients, but... Uh, it's, uh, you know, it, it's required, uh, and, and, you know, looking at today, uh, in my opinion, to be successful, you have to be a refractive cataract surgeon. Uh, if you're in the cataract field, I really believe the comprehensive ophthalmologist has to do MIGS, you know, microinvasive glaucoma surgery is, to me, uh, a requirement. Uh, I, I think the really successful practice probably should be looking at, uh, at uh, the medical therapy of, of, of retina. Uh, so many residents today do lots of uh, uh, sure. retinal in, in injections and uh, intravitreal injections, and I think that's going to be part of comprehensive ophthalmology as we go forward. We're going to soon have therapies for dry uh, AMD, starting with geographic atrophy, but maybe moving down, uh, down the food chain to more advanced uh, dry AMD. So those things you may or may not have been exposed to in your, in your residency, and so you have to adopt them. And I, I found it certainly very, very doable. I mean, one needs to do the training. Uh, I, I'm a big advocate besides meetings of actually going and, and visiting people who are early into these fields when you're going to add something. So what I've always done uh, is gone and, and uh, you know, side by side, uh, uh, worked with people in their practices, and, and that's been one of the better educational uh, approaches for me. And, and we have this wonderful ophthalmic uh, uh, you know, fraternity sorority, if you will, sure. and, and we, can, you know, we can call people and say, can I come and just watch what you do? And uh, people do it with you all the time. People you know, have done it with uh, our practice all the time, and I've traveled all around the world and gone into people's clinics, gone into people's ORs, and it's a much better learning experience than... Uh, simply going to a meeting. It's funny you say that. So on Cataract Coach, I post a new video every day. And of the 365 videos of 2022, the number one most popular one was where I simply put a, my phone camera on the wall of my OR and recorded everything that happened from the start of one case to the start of the next case. Just because people want to see, as you said, what happens behind the scenes in the operating room. Right. Yeah, what do you usually do? And I'm, I've been around a while, and one of my early uh, friends was Charles Kelman, and, uh, and he created a, a program that he called Surgicus, and what he did is he went around, and uh, you had to sign up. I was one of the surgeons that was involved, and uh, 
And what you had to agree to do was to let them come into your OR and film every case for that day, even if you did something, uh, you know, uh, that you were a little embarrassed about or if you had some complications or whatever it was, that's what they really, that's what they really wanted to uncover. And you, you, there was no editing. It was just every case the way it went. And there, of course, would be some beautiful cases, but there would be some more challenging cases. And, uh, and Surgicast is one of those that I remember. I actually had a... Uh, impending choroidal hemorrhage. It was a oh, phaco wow. case, so it was easy to manage, but but it was real, and people got to you know watch that if you simply close the wound, you know you could close you could manage the case. So yeah, that's a great idea because people sometimes forget that the videos you see at meetings or online are cherry picked. Yeah, well they pick your you know if you're going to show something at a teaching program, uh, at a meeting you're going to pick one of your better cases, and then sure. you're going to edit it down from. <laughs> From uh, you know, and and you might even speed it up, right? Times one and a half times. Those are the, you know, classical in quotes tricks to look at, make it look smooth. So you're at one and one half times uh, your uh, pace, and you you've edited out any of the, uh, you know, and the glitches, if you will. So, uh, but you go watch somebody live, and you see how they interact with the patients in sure. between. You see how the patients come into their operating room, how they leave, how they manage the uh, traffic, and how they interact with the patients, what they say to the patients. You know, my friend Bobby Osher has uh, this book called What I Say uh, that I participated in, and just listening to people that are you know, experienced and expert interact with patients, uh, a, great, a great learning experience. Oh, fantastic. Now, about live surgery events, they were more popular, it seems, a decade ago. Do you think we're going to get back to doing more live surgery events? It was one of my favorite things. Yeah, I uh, helped found a, a program actually in uh, Italy uh, with the Italian Society of Cataract Refractive Surgery, first with Lucio Barato and then with Matteo Piavello, where the whole meeting Entire was meeting, live yeah. surgery. And, and you've been there and participated. And uh, you saw some amazing things from surgeons around the world during those meetings. We saw cases where the surgeons in the middle of a case just would say, no more, and get up and say they couldn't finish the case and someone else would have to... You know, yeah. come in and, and do it. And these were, in quotes, some of the uh, top surgeons uh, in, sure. in, in the world. And uh, the Surgicus is, is video, but we still have the live program that Alcon puts on at the uh, at ASCRS and AAO. I, I, I think, you know, live surgery is a, is a great learning experience. And even better, though, is to actually, you know, go on site and spend in a person. day yeah. and watch, you know, Cataract Coach is a fabulous program, Uday, but what I would encourage people to do is come and spend a day with you. And sure. it's even a more valuable experience. So, Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, if you do participate in that meeting, I've learned the most important saying is, guarda la luce, look at the light. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> look at the light if it's in, uh, if it's in Spanish. And un poco dolorosa, a little bit of pain, yeah. whatever. So, uh, and often, I mean, it's a challenge sometimes because you... For sure. Uh, you have a scrub uh, nurse, you've never worked in that OR, yeah. you have a scrub person who's never worked with you, an anesthetist that's never never uh, worked with you, and, uh, and you know, I've, I've done these live programs uh, around the world, and we could talk for an hour about some of the fun stories uh, uh, in, in that regard, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it is a variable, a valuable ex learning experience for everyone to see that type of live surgery, and to see me do a single case in Thailand, or a single case in Italy, or is is valuable but more valuable to be to come and watch me work for a day in in minneapolis so for sure now if you're trying a new technology let's say a new surgical procedure a new device a new iol how do you explain to your patient that they may be the first patient you're doing this for well i've always done it in a you know in a very you know honest and direct fashion uh but but also sort of a thoughtful and, and tactful fashion so we, we tell patients when we're adopting new technologies that we, you know, are adopting the new technology. Uh, usually it's actually not a, something that's uh, totally different than anything we've ever done before. So we're simply making an incremental uh, advance in, in what, we've, uh, what we've done before. Um, and, you know, if patients, uh, you know, aren't, uh, you know, aren't uh, ready for that, if that's the right word, then, you know, there are, you know, there are alternatives that they can do. Sure. You know, I, I've been a big advocate, you know, I, I spent a decade in academics, full-time geographic academics, and, but, you know, I'm a, I'm a big advocate of what I call the academic private practice, and, and when I went into private practice, that's what I, I wanted to create, and the academic private practice uh, 
today is involved in, in uh, clinical trials and in, in teaching. And uh, so many times you are uh, adapting these new technologies in a clinical trial. And so the patients who enter in a clinical trial they know. You know, get meaningful informed consent about the fact sure. that you know, this is a new technology, here's the, uh, you know, here's the risks, benefits, and alternatives, and, uh, and they're you know, allowed to say yay or nay. And, and most of us think when we're engaging in the clinical trial, we've got something to offer that could be an advance. But in the modern world, you know, there, there clearly does need to be you know, proper informed consent, and, sure. and, and pa patients should have a choice, and they do have a choice. Now, talking about academic medicine, so I did something similar to you where I actually retired this year after 22 years of teaching residents. I had a fantastic time, but it was time to change gears, pass the baton, if you will. But I was fortunate I did, in parallel, a private practice half the week and academics half the week. And I thought that was a fantastic thing. For our younger viewers, for Cataract Coach, can you kind of give us the differences of academic versus private practice, challenges of each? And how about making the transition from one to the other? Well, the, uh, you know, it, it, I personally think if someone has the training and is offered the opportunity in a place they desire to live to uh, start in an academic medical center, uh, either part-time or full-time, that, that they should take that opportunity. So we... we trained fellows still today, and I, you know, those that can and are given the opportunity, I think, uh, uh, you know, to get, gain that academic experience, uh, particularly you have so much to bring to the sure. young residents right out of your training, that that, that is a, a positive and you can relate to them, you know, very effectively. The most fun thing about uh, academics for me was the interaction with the, with the residents and the fellows, and so we had you know, first when I was on, on the cornea service and ran the uh, uh, VA hospital uh, service, you know, I had a first, a second, and a third year resident and a fellow. So we had all the different uh, years. You build some, you know, wonderful relationships sure. and uh, and and do some very useful things. Now in private practice or in quotes academic medical practice at uh, at Minnesota Eye Consultants, we still train fellows uh, and uh, and so at that post uh, graduate level, if you will. That's rewarding uh, as well, but it's not quite the same as being immersed in the whole thing. It used to be if you wanted to do, you know, meaningful clinical research, it was mostly done at academic centers. Now it's not anymore. Really, sure. more is done in private practice. Uh, but if you want to do bench research uh, uh, of any sort, Basic that's science. pretty much reserved. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I did bench research, original uh, research in corneal preservation and some early errors. I couldn't have done that in uh, in private practice, and I could do that at an academic center, but it's really easy to go from an academic center into private practice. Uh, in, it has been my experience, and it's more difficult, not impossible, but more difficult to go from private practice into an academic sure. uh, medical center. So if you get that opportunity as a young doctor, typically you'll be fellowship trained. Yeah. I, would, I would encourage people to, uh, to take it. So, Yeah, I think one of the most meaningful things for me is you know, I've trained 200 residents all across the country, some even international. And then I feel almost like a proud dad seeing them do such amazing yeah. things in their career. Yeah, that's been the most fun. I, when, when, you know, I've done some inventing and I've done a lot of writing over 400 peer-reviewed publications. I've been the editor at OSN, a lot of education, traveled around the world teaching, met a lot of wonderful people. But when people ask me, you know, what, what do you rank the most... Uh, personally gratifying, it's the fellows that I've trained. And, sure. You know, cer certainly residents as well and, and colleagues as well. But when you spend a whole year with someone, which is uh, what you do in a fellowship, and actually when I was at the university, we sometimes had two-year fellows. So you spend one to two years with someone, you build an amazing relationship. And, sure. You know, those 80 or so that I've had that relationship with over the past uh, since 1978, when I started, uh, you know, th those relationships are are uh, very special. They're very precious. So, so that's you know, as I look back, that's the one thing that I would say uh, was the most gratifying, or that I definitely, if I had to give everything up, I wouldn't want to give up. Of course, you have to be a clinician and have practice. Of course, I wouldn't want to give up uh, the the fellowship training that uh, I was engaged in. Oh, I can relate so much. I, you know, I've been only retired now for a few months from teaching residents, and 
I miss them. I miss hanging out oh, with them. For sure, yeah. yeah. And you were mainly working with second and third year residents, probably, and so. Well, yeah. Well, uh, my main thing was actually fourth year residents in the OR. I wanted to, yeah, right. Get your that's kind of like speed. a fellowship, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So that that's really fun for a surgeon, and you know, I always had a, a surgery dominated practice, and so do you, and so really, you know, teaching those skills and transferring that knowledge and and uh, and skill is uh, very rewarding. So. Changing gears a little bit, what do you think about the future with private equity in ophthalmology? Because this is not the first time private equity has been involved. And I remember back when I was probably even in med school, maybe early 90s, there was a big foray as well. Where do you see all this? Is it still good opportunities for young doctors coming out of training? What's your input here? Well, our, our group, Minnesota Eye Consultants, was the founding practice in a a private equity uh, consolidation called Unify Vision Partners. We're into our sixth year, so I, I've lived it. Uh, we actually also <laughs> were involved in the physician practice management uh, company uh, consolidation uh, a decade uh, or more ago and working with a company called Vision 21. So I've done both, plus I've been in academic medical uh, care and I've been in private independent medical care. The PPMC model, uh, you know, was flawed. It isn't. Uh, it wasn't really a private equity model. It was more of a pro- public company arbitrage model, where you uh, shared a certain amount of a practice's revenue in return for uh, public stock. And uh, and most of those companies sort of took off like a rocket and then crashed uh, uh, because it wasn't sustainable. Um, and so that was a flawed model. Uh, fortunately, most of us uh, did okay with it and were able to, uh, you know, get out of it and recover. Uh, but it damaged some practices, so it was sort of uh, sad. The uh, private equity model is slightly different. In the private equity model, you're actually selling your practice. And so there are, you know, multiple uh, practice consolidators today. I mean, there are hospitals that are, are buying practices. There are, uh, you know, United Healthcare, an insurer, is, uh, you know, buying a lot of practices and doctors. I, I think uh, United Healthcare owns, uh, has, employs something like 60,000 doctors. Wow. Not so much in ophthalmology, but if you count uh, private care and internal medicine and the like, they're a major uh, consolidator. And, and so private equity is basically, a, if you will, another uh, consolidator. And, uh, again, it depends significantly on who you choose as a partner, but for sure. the... Uh, you know, for the partner in a practice who has built meaningful value over time, you know, partnering with uh, private equity can be positive, especially if it's a practice that can and, and wants to grow. Uh, so our partners have done, you know, really good, and I would say they would all uh, vote yes again, you know, six years later, uh, as they did five years before. We had 100% yes votes in our 10 partners at Minnesota wow. Eye, and I think they would all still vote yes. Not to say that it's perfect, because sure. you do bring, you know, another partner in, and just like, you know, solo practice where you just decide is different than a partnership. Younger doctors is a legitimate question, and so we have found that we've been able to recruit uh, uh, really high-quality people to join our practice. Uh, we have created a, uh, a way in, uh, in our practice for the younger doctor that joins us to also be able to equity integrate. Oh, nice. Uh, but nice. Th- there is, uh, not every uh, private equity company does that. Um, and so it is something that you need to be, you know, thoughtful about. Um, I-, I just think the winds of change, uh, as I say, they keep uh, blowing. But uh, I, right today, I think in ophthalmology, something like uh, two out of three, maybe even uh, seven out of ten, young ophthalmologists that come out of training actually come out and become employee doctors. I mean, there's... A, wow, so different world. Yeah, 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 it's a different world than it used to be. And if you look in other fields, it's like 90% that come out and are employee doctors. You might be employed by an academic medical center. You might be employed sure. by a county hospital. You might be employed by a VA. You might be employed by a, a group like Kaiser. You might be employed by United Healthcare. You might be employed by a big hospital chain, or you might be employed in close by a private equity company. So the opportunities for totally independent practice are, are, uh, you know, are declining. Uh, But I still think there's something valuable about having an equity integration opportunity to be able to participate in the value growth. And so we've designed, uh, you know, Unify Vision Partners to allow that to continue. And again, we found that in that kind of a setting, we're still able to recruit, uh, if you will, the best and the brightest into our practice. 
I think one thing the younger generation of ophthalmologists does very well and better than certainly my generation did is figuring out that work-life balance. And I think maybe if you have a situation where they are, you know, more so employee-based, maybe they're, it's worth it to them to have more life, work-life balance. Well, you live in California, so you probably, uh, and you've watched the residents, and I'm, I'm only passing this on second hand, but if I, if I uh, you know, go back, uh, you know, maybe 30 years ago, uh, you know, it was not the top resident in a, in a program was usually going into a practice where they, you know, would uh, be able to become an equity owner. Uh, my understanding is that many of the top residents that finish training today are, are quite, uh, quite highly motivated to join a Kaiser or some other system like that. Um, they're guaranteed, uh, you know, immediately a good salary. They're guaranteed good benefits. Uh, there's a kind of a set retirement age like sure. there is in the, in the airlines, so they know they're going to retire comfortably after 30 to uh, 35 years, uh, and they're not going to have to manage... Uh, you know, the practice, which can be onerous uh, and challenging. So uh, so there's certainly some things to say for joining that uh, big established group practice, uh, you know, out of, out of training. Um, and uh, I think uh, the good news is, is all of those opportunities still exist in our field. But seven out of ten, if you will, of the opportunities that a, uh, a person finishing residency training or fellowship training today, seven out of ten of the opportunities that are available are to be uh, are going to be in a setting where you will be an employee doctor, a very well compensated and uh, employee doctor with a very high quality and rewarding lifestyle, in my opinion. But that's that's definitely been a change in my uh, in my lifetime. It used to be the only employee doctors were in academic medical centers or maybe working for a VA or a, uh, a Hennepin County or in our in our city, the the Minneapolis County Hospital. Yeah, it's a kind of an interesting idea that, you know, you can balance out things that are more important to you. One of the mistakes I made was years ago when I was doing a lot of ophthalmic consulting was taking so many trips, even international trips every month, that I didn't spend enough time with my kids. And it was you who gave me the advice and said, you know, spend the time with your kids. Ophthalmology will still be here. And now that my kids are grown up, adult kids living on the East Coast, that was the best advice ever. So yeah. I think if the young generation can balance it out and have that work-life balance, spend more time with their families at the earlier part of their career, maybe the overall trade-off's worth it. Yeah, it worked out well for you. So when I sit down with uh, my fellows and perhaps occasionally some other younger uh, ophthalmologists that seek me out, I'm a big believer in what I call uh, five-year plan. You know, I think it's hard to look farther ahead than uh, five years. Uh, sure. And uh, and it's just not a five-year plan. It's sort of a one-year, three-year, five-year plan. But I'm on my eleventh five-year plan. The uh, first <laughs> one is the first one is uh, is your training plan, and I did uh, three-year residency and two years of fellowship. But you know, in that plan, you sit down with uh, the people that are important to you. It could be uh, uh, your a significant another, it could be other members of the family, it could be your children. Uh, sure. And in your case, I think that was the, the, the person and the people, the two people to sit down with. Uh, and you make a one, three, five in your plan that works for everyone. Uh, sure. And, uh, and uh, I was very compulsive about it. I mean, I, I, I could tell you, I can even do it today because I'm on my 11th five-year plan. If you ask me, what will you be doing on November 22nd, uh, three years from now, I could say, currently I plan to be X. Now, you might make a change, you know, along the way uh, for one reason or another, but I plan to be here and, and I plan to take this many weeks off and I plan to do uh, the following. Uh, and, and this is, you know, what I want to accomplish in my professional life, my personal life, my spiritual life, uh, and, uh, and interacting with friends. And it, it, it turns out what you plan is what happens. And so, yeah. So for your case, you know, when we were talking, I'm on my 11th five-year plan, right? So if you take two or three out of 11 five-year plans it's no big deal. off yeah. for your children, there's still, you know, I think I'll have, I'm planning on 12 five-year plans in ophthalmology, so that'll be 60 years. So if I took three off, that's only 15 out of 60 years, Yeah. right? And that those years with your children are really important. So I do think... Uh, 
you know, that, that the, 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 the really, I, I tell people, come out of practice, you know, work hard, build a quality practice, spend time with your family, and then you'll be surprised how quickly, you know, they'll be off to college. And, yeah, uh, the years go then, by. Then, you know, then, uh, you know, if you're interested, then you've still got 30 years left to, uh, you know, to teach and do research and interact with, uh, you know, with industry if you wish. And uh, you know, what you find is that you'll, you'll, what you think you might want to do 30 years from now might not be what you really want to do 30 sure. years from now. Just like for you, 10 years ago, you wanted to teach residents, and then for whatever reason, now you decided it's not as high a priority, right? So... Uh, and you'll be, and you now. Fortunately for us, now we're seeing you back at, you know, all of the the meetings that uh, that uh, that I'm involved in because you're a great teacher. And you know, congratulations on cataract coaches. Oh, thank the side. you. But just from the podium, you're a superb teacher, and so we're we're delighted to have you back. But it, it's not like. Uh, you know, ophthalmology failed because you took a few days of years off to spend with your family, right? <laughs> yeah, and, of course. And, 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 it, and the transition out and the transition in were, were, were comfortable. So, uh, and nobody grudges people. And I, I tend to be really honest. I sort of have that Midwest honest and direct. And so when people, uh, you know, call me up and ask me to do something, you know, I just say, I, you know what, I've, I've sort of reached my maximum for that month. And I'm, you know. My plate's I, full. I, my plate's full and I need uh, some time with my wife and my kids. And, yeah. uh, and uh, you know. Most of them are pretty understanding. Not all, but <laughs> most of them are pretty understanding. And, uh, I, and when people, I invite people to do something and they say no for family and personal reasons, I, you get what it. I say back is family first, you're doing the right thing, you know. So uh, we'll invite you back next year. So, Well, I love the idea of the five-year plan. Because you're right, yeah. it's hard to make a 10-year plan. It seems so onerous. So too weird. long, yeah. It's too long. And you're, you're, what you want to do changes. And what your family wants to do changes. So I'm... Yeah. I, I sit down uh, with my uh, my wife and uh, as the as the first uh, you know party in my current life and uh, and uh, between uh, the, after the Christmas uh, and between then and in January we spend a week just talking about what did we like about last year what would we like to be better about next year and then we think a little farther ahead you know I say, I say I do one three and five and we write it down. And, wow, that's uh, neat. And we gut check it and, you know, do a little bit of, you know, it's just like in a company, you have quarterly board meetings, right? So we have <laughs> your board three, meeting. Out 12, three out of 12, six out of 12, <laughs> nine out of 12, and then after 12 months, uh, you, know, you know, how did the company do last year? How did you personally in your sure. relationship with each other do? Did you have enough time for your kids? And I, I know I have two children and I have five grandchildren. You know, did we have enough time for them? Did we have enough time for each other? And it's easy uh, then to put it in a calendar and just you know block out uh, block out more more personal time. So yeah, I got I'm gonna try that five. I like that idea, the five year plan, and just kind of yep. d- dividing it up into five year segments. Yeah, well that that's I can I feel like I can look that far ahead. And again, looking back on it, here I am. I'm I'm like I said, I just began my eleventh five year plan in, in ophthalmology. I first uh, first started in ophthalmology in. Uh, 1972, believe it or not, but I'm on my 11th five-year plan. I think I've got two more five-year plans, and uh, but I, you know, I'll have to see how my health and and everything is after this five-year plan. But I know what I'm doing and want to do over the next five years, and a lot of it has to do with uh, things I want to do with uh, with my uh, my wife Jackie and my two children Michelle and Michael and their their five children, uh, and so that goes right in the the calendar as just as important as. Uh, you know, the American Academy of Ophthalmology or the American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgery or an ocular surgery news meeting or whatever. That's fantastic advice. Another thing that young doctors ask me about very frequently is how, for, how can they get involved in ophthalmic consulting, work with the companies, yeah. and in essence, kind of helping lead where our field will go in the future. What's yeah. your sage advice for a young doctor, a few years out of training, who desires to be Work with the companies, doing some innovation on the podium, etc. Yeah. So sometimes people will will uh, you know be in too big a hurry, I think. And so what I, what I so since we're going to have fifty to sixty years of practice, I, I tell them it bothers them sometimes, but I tell the current resident that 
you know, you're going to probably not only have to, but want to practice at least until you're 80 and you're 30 now when you finish your training. So you've got at least 10 five-year plans. <laughs> so, I, so, so the first couple of five-year plans are, are to build um, a big practice, you know. So if you're going to be, a, in quotes, a key opinion leader, uh, you can't do it uh, without uh, a meaningful practice. Uh, sure. And so the first thing is to build a, a meaningful practice. Uh, and uh, then find something that you're really passionate about. Because if you're going to you know, work all week till Friday night and get on an airplane and go somewhere either for a, uh, a meeting or a medical advisory board, uh, if it's not something you're passionate about, you know, you won't persist. Sure. Uh, and so, so is it cataract surgery? Is it, is it the cornea? Is it uh, glaucoma? Uh, it can be any of those fields. But once, once you build a meaningful practice in that, in that area uh, and uh, then are interested in uh, taking the next step, uh, the easiest thing is to start to get involved in, in clinical trials. Uh, and okay. you can just do that by working with the local rep or, or calling uh, an Uday Devgan and he can introduce you to, uh, uh, you know, a company that uh, is, uh, you know, interested in young doctors, and they all are, sure. uh, and, and engaging them in clinical trials. They'll come out and do a site visit at your practice, and the first thing they're going to look at is if you say, I want to do clinical trials in, uh, in, uh, in keratoplasty, and they come out and you do three keratoplasties a year, you know, yes. it, it's not going to work, right? So, For so sure. basically, the, the, the first thing that's important to someone doing clinical trials, and there's new ones starting every, every day, um, is that in that area is recruitment. And so they, sure. they want, you know, young doctors who can uh, do quality surgery, let's say, let's talk about surgery, because it can be in medical therapy as well, uh, and they can do the cases and have the patients. Uh, and then, then you do need to build a, build a bit of an infrastructure to support that. So you need a research uh, person who is sort of focused on that and uh, uh, and then as, as you start to participate in these clinical trials, you become a world expert in that new thing, right? So sure. if you're the first one that ever did a, you know, a, an, a eczema laser, uh, you know, treatment for myopia, if you're the first one that ever did it, well, you, you are almost instantaneously, or even in the first 20 that did it, sure. you're instantaneously a key opinion leader. And, and if that gets number one, the companies want to pick your brain, so now you're on a medical advisory board. Yeah. And then number two, they want you to train the next generation of doctors how to sure. do it once it's FDA approved. And then, then, then once you're at that level, you know, once you're being invited to the meetings, you're being invited to, to medical advisory board uh, meetings, uh, you have proven that you're a good clinical investigator. It just snowballs, and, and then then you have the problem that you had, Uday. Yeah. Now what do I do? Because I'm getting on an airplane every Friday, <laughs> yeah, and I'm exactly. flying some I'm flying somewhere, and my kids are getting ready to enter high school, and and I've got to you know get it back under control. But um, you know, once you prove yourself, the demand is uh, is high. But you don't immediately go from I finished my residency yesterday. I don't have any practice, and now I want to join the. Uh, you know, XYZ company medical advisory board. You know, it, first you have to build a practice, sure, and then and then kind of stake your ground. What what areas and specialties are you interested in, and then prove yourself. Uh, you know, as a clinician, surgeon, in clinical trials, uh, and then it, it just goes automatically from there. And then if you decide you want to, you know, you want to get involved in, uh, you know, the next level. You know, there there are opportunities to. Uh, you know, be involved in investment and innovation and even sure. serve on boards, et cetera. But that tends to be more like uh, five-year plan number eight, you know, sure. when, you, when, you, when you get to that level. Uh, and, and so you're just, you're just sort of coming up on that level now. So. Well, I love, the, I love the pearl. So first, build your practice. So you have a, a busy right. practice. Right. Focus on something that's your passion. If you're passionate about a, a, a surgery, you're going to naturally excel in that. So I like that idea as well. And then be patient. It's going to take time. Be patient with it. And if you are involved with a clinical trial, be meticulous. Yeah, you know, there's nothing worse than uh, than uh, talking a company and uh, adding you to a to a uh, clinical trial, and here you are six months out, and you've only recruited one patient. Yeah. Uh, for example, that's uh, you know, I mean, that, and it happens. You know, I'm on the other side of it nowadays, right? So. So I'm there trying to pick the 10 or 12 or 15 uh, sites, uh, maybe 20 sites that are going to do a 
clinical trial, and we have some that six months out they haven't uh, enrolled a single patient. Well, you know that that's you know that is not a win for anyone, right? Sure. So, you got to know your patient population. In the last 10, 15 years, I've shied away from being involved in clinical trials only because I know my Beverly Hills patients actually yeah. often do not want to participate in any trial regardless of what the financial incentive is. That's right. So yeah, know your population. Yeah. yeah, They might not. And uh, and so a, a way for you to do that, and, and, and maybe a way for some to do that, is to is to do what you did, uh, you know, from a teaching perspective, yes. right? So, so you can, uh, you know, my my two super high quality uh, senior partners, the two people that joined me after I, I founded my private practice, uh, Tom Samuelson and David Harton, who are sort of household names in glaucoma and, and cornea. The first ten years of their practice, they did what you did. They they practiced at Minnesota Eye Consultant three days a week. And they practiced at the uh, you know county the hospitals, yeah, county teaching hospitals two days a week. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, they were at Minnesota Eye Consultants, building a consultative practice. Tuesday, Thursday, they were they were teaching the residents. And of course, no better way to build a consultative practice than to teach the residents, right? So, Absolutely. But but they did clinical trials, and you know, we did them in our practice, of course, as well. But I mean, they they, they could also do the, the that type of clinical trial in that academic medical center. So. Well, it's another important concept that your practice pattern and your practice style, your, it will evolve with time. The way That's you start right. off is not what you're going to do for life. And similarly, your first job may be amazing, but I say your first job is often like your first boyfriend or girlfriend. They're fantastic, but it may not be the one you're with forever. So I think, yeah, it's an important concept that your practice can change or morph with time. And you can start off being part-time private practice, part-time academics, part-time county hospital, and then go from there. Absolutely. You can, you know, as I said, you can go academics to private and even back to academics. So my, my, one of my great models for that is my good friend, you know, Roger Steinert. He went, sure. uh, you know, he was at Harvard, and then he went into ophthalmology consultants of Boston, and then he became chairman at UC Irvine. Uh, you know, and, and so we, you, you can move in any direction. And I... You know, I've seen the studies, and, and about 50% of residents land in a practice that makes them happy and they stay there. Sure. But about 50% change at least once, and about uh, 20% change uh, twice. And uh, and for me, I actually changed, uh, you know, I, I'm in my, at Minnesota I I'm in my third practice. You know, I started in private practice in Dallas, Texas, joined the faculty at the University of Minnesota, and was chief at the Minneapolis VA, did that for a decade. Then, uh, then found a Minnesota Eye. So, I, so I, for me, it was three, and uh, it wasn't because any of them were bad, but but you know, both personal reasons and or my wife didn't like Dallas, so that was why I moved back to Minneapolis. <laughs> and then I, I finally, my 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 uh, private practice, uh, my clinical practice, got so big, it wasn't manageable in an academic, uh, geographic, academic medical center. So I, I, I kind of had to go I either change my you know, what I wanted to do or, or go into private practice because uh, it turns out that most academic medical centers are not quite as efficient uh, as most private practices can be if you own your own ASC and the like. So Sure. Do you think for ASCs, good topic, are we going to move more into office-based surgery, clinic-based surgery? Well, we are, but it, you know, what I tell uh, everyone today is if you can, uh, you need to be on the facility side to be... Uh, best positioned, if you will, for success and prosperity in, in modern ophthalmology. Uh, ideally, it's an ASC, but there are certain uh, environments where people, because of certificates of need or other uh, reasons, are locked out of, uh, you know, participating in an ambulatory surgery center. And I think for those patients, uh, for those doctors, an office-based surgery center is, is uh, an option. Uh, office-based surgery centers... Uh, you know, do especially well if you have meaningful private pay. Uh, sure. And so when you're looking at, uh, uh, at, at at doing that, if you've got a lot of, uh, you know, uh, if you will, premium IOLs, you're doing refractive lens exchanges, you're doing phacic IOLs, uh, maybe you're doing refractive corneal surgery and you're going to put a, uh, a laser, uh, you know, in that office base center as well. Um, if you're doing, that's where office-based surgery centers really, really do do well, is in the uh, 
in a private pay sector. They can be okay in the third party pay sector, but there's reimbursement challenges there. Sure. Well, when you bring up ASC, it reminds me of a saying that you had that was very important to me when I first started to practice the Lindstrom five A's. And one of those A's, of course, being the ASC. Do you want to review those for our, our younger viewers? If you haven't heard of this, this is fantastic. This changed the way I focused on my career. Yeah, well, let's see if I can do it and remember them all. You help me off. I'll this help one. you. But, 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 but the, the most, uh, the most uh, the number one is availability. Yeah. You know? So if you want to be a, a successful and busy, you know, show up, you know, dress up and show up in the office, right? So I have have office uh, office hours and so that's uh, availability uh, number two is affability yeah meaning that that you treat your patients well and they uh, uh, they say positive things and and number three actually is ability so it, it does matter to be good at it does matter to be be good at what you do but interesting enough if you're if you're available and another doctor's not available even if that doctor might it. have greater availability that patient's going to see you and and again, if you treat the patient well, uh, even though uh, you might not be quite as skilled as the best surgeon in the world, if that the best surgeon in the world has a bad, uh, you know, bedside manner, you're, you're going to actually do yeah. uh, better as well. So that was the classic three: was you know availability, uh, you know affability, and ability. And then you know own own an ambulatory surgery center is uh, is uh, certainly uh, important as well. And then in the modern world, and this one sometimes make uh, make people uncomfortable you know, I, I call it advertising but you know some some form of internal and external promotion. marketing sure yeah promotion so i call I, to make it an a i called it advertising but it's basically you have to uh, get the word level, out make people aware that you exist right? yeah you got to so, get the word out for sure today it's uh, social media but in some cases it can actual be be actual uh, external marketing but people come into your office see what the the images you know they look you up on the internet uh, you may be uh, in a blog or two etc so those i think i got it those are the five a's I you got it i haven't well, added another one since so <laughs> <laughs> but no I think those are such important principles for the young doctor starting in, pre in the career it really makes a world of difference and you know like you say for the the promotion within your practice you know, every, I always think every cataract patient I do surgery on, he or she has a bunch of grandkids who are prime age, and they probably want LASIK too. And if, but yeah. if that patient, your cataract patient, doesn't know you even offer it, he or she can't tell their grandkids. Yeah, number one uh, source of referrals, even though you know we're we're pretty integrated with uh, both MD and and op optometric referral in our practice. The the biggest source of referrals continues to be word of mouth, and uh, and what I learned early on, and I had my mentors as well, is was to ask, you know ask every patient to send sure. their friends, basically. So some patient would say to you, oh, "Dr. Lindstrom, you're great. Thank you. You did such a nice job in my cataract surgery." And I would say, "Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Tell your friends. You know, you know, the the biggest compliment you can pay me is to send me send me your friends." And mm -hmm. it's interesting. They just kind of brighten up and they go, Oh, I mean you 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 you'd like you you'd like me to do that? You'd like me to recommend you? And I go, <laughs> Yes. yes. <laughs> I'd like you to recommend me. <laughs> and I, I'm sure in uh, in uh, in a Beverly Hills practice it's critically important and in the certainly uh, in a, in our practice in in uh, Minneapolis it's certainly very important. But I also satellited out to small communities in uh, in rural Minnesota just because I enjoyed it for decades. Sure. Uh, it was important even in the smaller community. So yeah, I like the idea. I tell patients uh, when they're when they're so thankful and so happy on post op day one or post op week one, I usually give them five business cards and say, "Do me a favor, tell five people this week." Yeah, there you go. That's the tell your friends. That's what yeah. you know. So my my mentor on on how to talk to patients was a, a name that many people know, Malcolm McCannell. But I mean, he just had a uh, a style that was uh, very enviable. But uh, you know, I just when I was a very young doctor, I'd i just watch him interact with patients, and then he'd say, well, you know, send me your friends, and I'd say over and over and over again. And it was interesting. The patient would just grin from ear to ear and, like, yeah. you know, I can, I, can do something, I can do something in return for what you've done for me, and uh, besides, you know, pay my bill. But <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's something that has, can be very powerful. Yeah, patients, uh, fellow residents or, or young residents are sometimes surprised to hear that my number one referral source is, in fact, like you said, just word of mouth. 
Right. And it's the strongest. Right. It means the most. Are we training yeah. enough ophthalmologists? We continue to have nationwide still only about 460 ophthalmology yeah. residency spots a year. So we're only graduating yeah. 460 a year. Not all work full time. Like, look at me. I'm not working full time at the moment. Are we training enough? No. So, so when I talk about practice, you know, economics sort of at a helicopter level, the number I have is that we train about 450 residents a year. And so 460, you and I have about the same, sure. same numbers. And that's somewhere around 500 uh, retire every year. So, wow. so every year there are 50 less ophthalmologists. And, you know, that's small, but, I mean, every decade there are 500 less. Yeah. Uh, and then with the aging population, if you look at uh, uh, the amount of care that's required over the age of 65, and it's just not an immediate turnoff, but, I mean, sure. over 65, uh, you know, requires 10x the eye care that under 65 does. So oh, for the, sure. As the population ages, the demand continues to explode. And so one thing that is nice, if you will, or reassuring to the younger op Maladi doctor is they they'll be busy right so yeah. they're, they're they're not going to be sitting on their hands uh, they're going to be extremely busy they they will have to more even than we have learn to be efficient uh, and then probably uh, over time we will of necessity uh, continue to need to work collegially with care extenders and I mean the number one care extender is uh, optometry but another potential care extender is uh, physician's assistants and nurse practitioners, and, and a third is, uh, you know, certified ophthalmic medical technicians and the like. So so I'm a big advocate of what I've called the, it's O-L-E-I-D, I call it the ophthalmologist-led integrated eye care delivery model. So the, mm. I start with I start with ophthalmology-led because it could be, you know, led by any number of people, but ophthalmology-led and then integrated eye care delivery model, and that means working side by side, MDs, ODs, nurse practitioners. Uh, a team approach. Uh, or physicians, assistants, techs, opticians, and the like. And, but at the top, uh, you know, leading is, is the ophthalmologist. And, and that's, what, that's what our practice is. And we have, we have all of the above, and they all play a meaningful role. And uh, when we're all working side by side, some of these uh, turf battles have a, have a way of going away. But who decides what people do in our practice is, uh, the, ophthalmologist. is the ophthalmologist, right? right. So, uh, and, uh, you know, every practice may have a slightly different culture and may, we certainly have, uh, you know, laws and other things that may, uh, that may be different state to state. But, you know, I, I like it when, when an ophthalmologist is leading a practice and making those decisions. And, you know, usually those decisions are then made in the best interest of patients. Yeah, I do like that team approach. I think it makes it uh, very, very helpful to treat the maximum of patients and that each person can do what they're really ultimately best trained for. That's right. And every year we have more optometrists, you know, and, uh, and uh, so you know, I think some people will think of that as a bad thing. I think over time we're going to find it's a good thing because it's going to be required to uh, you know, nationwide deliver eye care uh, and uh, we'll still be at, if you will, the, the top of that uh, uh, pecking order. And, and, but uh, every year there's also more nurse practitioners and physician's assistants. Where we're really challenged uh, is uh, in that whole field of, uh, of ophthalmic assistant to certified ophthalmic technician to certified ophthalmic you know, technologist to certified ophthalmic medical technologist. There's sort of, we, we, we have ophthalmic assistant A, B, and then COT uh, and yeah. COMT, and uh, we, that is a, there's nobody training them, unfortunately, uh, in a meaningful number uh, other than our own practices, and, and we're very short nationwide on, on, on that support group. So uh, everyone's trying to figure out a way to solve that problem, but nobody has been able to uh, figure out how to do it yet. So and then we the to nurses too, you know. And, yeah. So... Like in the UK, oh. a lot of the nurse practitioners are doing all the intravitreal injections. That's right. The only thing we're not short of, and I don't mean this in a negative way because I'm very positive, the only thing we actually are not short of is optometrists. And so, so the, the practice that's on their knees and is going to try to uh, you know, figure out what to do next, uh, we should, you'll just think about how to take advantage of, that, uh, of those colleagues. Uh, you know, maybe a quick anecdote. You may or may not leave this in, O'Day, but I had... Uh, a pretty close uh, friend, a young ophthalmologist, joined a practice in northern Minnesota. I won't name the city, but, you know, a very nice northern Minnesota city, but still northern Minnesota. 
there were three, there were two senior ophthalmologists. They recruited this young ophthalmologist, so three doctor practice. Well, the two senior ophthalmologists retired. So here was this young, <laughs> young, uh, you know, basically, I think he was probably about 35 year old ophthalmologist had, who had a three ophthalmologist practice all of a sudden. And uh, he did everything he could to try to recruit, uh, you know, another ophthalmologist to join him. And he just couldn't get anyone to come to that, uh, that individual town. So he said, well, I, I'm going to shut down. You know, he called me up, said, I'm going to, I'm going to shut down and I'm going to move, you know, to the Twin Cities and join a group. Are you looking for anyone? And, uh, uh, and I said, well, you're a great doctor. We might think about it, but you know, here's an alternative. Why don't you hire four optometrists? Yeah. And, uh, and basically they can do, because they were, you know, a comprehensive ophthalmology practice. They had an optical shop. They sold, uh, glasses, did contact lenses. They did a lot of primary care. And then, and then you just do those things that you don't, you don't feel comfortable or the sure. state laws don't allow an optometrist to do. And to be honest, 10 years later, he's one of the happiest ophthalmologists I know. He stayed uh, uh, alone. He's got a very busy surgical and uh, complex medical practice. And then uh, his, uh, he has four employee optometrists who, uh, uh, you know, and, and in a smaller town, uh, the local hospital allows them to take call and, uh, you know, he backs them up, but uh, he sure. really has to, uh, he really has to, you know, go in, if you will. And so, so rather than that community having no eye care, they now have an extremely uh, high quality eye care uh, with a superb ophthalmologist and his, uh, his four optometrist uh, uh, employees. So, you know, it was a win for the local community, a win for him. Sure. And a win. the optometrists are ecstatic. They love it as they, they get to a very interesting practice as well. And uh, so it's kind of like you can create a win-win-win. It doesn't work everywhere, but I, uh, I think it's a model that is sustainable and that might work other places as well. Well, I think you're right. I mean, surgically, we're going to get busier and busier and busier. With that aging population, yeah. the amount of retina disease, glaucoma disease, cataract, it's just going to keep increasing. And so surgically, right. with every year we're creating a deficit number of ophthalmologists, we're going to work harder and harder, or as you would say, be more efficient. Even. Yeah. Well, when I started, uh, you know, again, another anecdote, but when I started uh, in, uh, you know, in practice, the classical private practitioner would see two patients an hour, right? Yeah. And, uh, and no longer and, the case, and do about two hundred surgical cases a year, right? Now, now the you know ophthalmologist has to see at least four, and in in our practice, our ophthalmologist sees six. Yeah. And as we look ahead, I think they need to see eight to ten patients an hour, and uh, and they'll be doing you know a thousand to fifteen hundred cases a year, and uh, um, you know you have to be much more efficient. Uh, uh, to do that. Probably, uh, I'll just pass this on as well. I mean, most ophthalmologists are going to be four days, if they work five days a week, you know, not everybody does, but if you work five days a week, you'll be four days in the office and one day in the OR. And so one thing that uh, some ophthalmologists neglect a little bit is paying adequate attention to their office-based practice. And there's a lot of revenue, revenue uh, and efficiencies available in the office-based practice with a little focus as well. And then one needs to go somewhere where they can do, you know, all the cases that are generated in, uh, you know, in four days in the clinic, and that's going to be a thousand to fifteen hundred. You need to be able to do those in one day in the OR. Yeah. So you need a pretty efficient OR. As you well. got to do twenty-five so, cases, right? Or... Got to do twenty, thirty cases a day on your surgery day, and uh, which which is very doable, sure. as we know. And then see forty to fifty patients a day in the office, and that's the future. Uh, and it's, you know, it's just more people are going to get quality care. And then I think have one to two optometrists working by your side. So that's awesome. So let's start to wrap this up. I want to finish on a simple topic, which is, so you're on your 10th five-year plan, which is amazing. Of those 10, I'm on my 11th, <laughs> oh, 11. of the 10 previous five-year plans, what have been some of the big wins or biggest challenges or best ups, toughest downs? Well, the biggest challenge uh, has been, in, uh, you know, creating balance. And yeah. amazingly enough, even in my 11th five-year plan, it's still, if I wanted to, I could get in an airplane even today and fly somewhere in the world, uh, you know, for a meeting or a medical advisory board. So even, uh, even today, uh, you know, 
with, I, I retired from clinical practice December 31, uh, just this last year, 2022, after 50 years. Even today, without seeing patients, I, I could be, you know, too uh, committed, you know, yeah. to my, my uh, profession. So I think, I think n- number one is to do those five-year plans and make sure they include your family. Uh, and I, I definitely went through periods in my, my life where I was out of balance. Uh, and, you know, well, fortunately, uh, you know, I, I got uh, reeled in, you know, along the way a little bit before it was too late. But, I, I mean, I'm, I'm very happily married, but my, my wife is my second wife. And, you know, I think my, uh, my first wife might have paid a little bit of a penalty for some of that Im- Im- imbalance. Uh, and so, uh, you know, just try not to get out of, uh, out of balance and make sure you have some time for yourself uh, sure. as well, uh, so that whatever it is you like to do, uh, you know, uh, yourself and for friends are critically important, I think, uh, as well. Uh, so uh, those are uh, sort of the key, the key lessons. Uh, and then to realize that, that your desires are going to continue to change, and that sure. just goes back to the five-year plan again. So keep upgrading your plan and, and actually write it down. And then review it every three months and make sure you didn't make a mistake as to what you really wanted to do. Uh, and you'll, you'll find that things change. When I was younger, I said, well, when my second home, I wanted to be in the mountains. I loved to ski. Uh, I had all these places picked out in Vail and whatnot. And then when I finally was in a position to have a second home, I didn't want to go to the mountains anymore. <laughs> yeah. I went to Newport Beach and uh, you know, bought a place in the sunny, sunny Newport Beach and played tennis and golf and... Uh, while I still ski a little, I don't ski very much. So, uh, you know, so I, so I spent 30 years planning to buy a second home in, in the mountains. I had them picked out. I had them priced out. And then when I was finally ready to do it, I, I bought a, 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 a place on the beach in Newport Beach. So, yeah, so different so years. I, you, you, you will find that what you want to do uh, changes. And, uh, you know, it will depend on, you know, if you have uh, children, what they decide to do. In my case, they both moved back to Minnesota, got good jobs, started having children, and, you know, then that changes what you want to do sure. uh, as well. So, so I would say you have to have some flexibility. And uh, I, I think uh, medicine or and ophthalmology in our case is in what I call a very demanding mistress. It does take a lot of time. It can totally consume you. Uh, yeah. And uh, just be, be careful, uh, you know, not to let it totally consume you. I think that's fantastic advice. It's, I think we all struggle with that balance. And uh, slowly but surely over time, we figure out what works best for us and our families. That's right. And as long as you keep, keep honestly uh, looking at it and analyzing it and then asking those people that matter to you how what you're doing is impacting them. So, you know, so you might be very happy and then find out that your wife or husband and your children are not so happy or <laughs> your, friend, your friends haven't heard from you in the in a long time, or how come we haven't seen you uh, at men's sure. tennis on Monday night in six weeks, or, or you know, our, your four-person golf group and you haven't played the whole summer. You know, sure. it, you know, every now and then you need to see how is this impacting uh, others as well. So, Fantastic advice. Well, I continue to admire you, and I'm going to take away from this that I need to get a five-year plan mentality, and we'll go from there. But I want to thank you again for participating in this podcast And for all our Cataract Coach viewers, we're going to have a podcast like this once or twice a month for the foreseeable future where we'll do a deep dive into some of the more hidden aspects of ophthalmology and how you can achieve your own potential and balance in your career and personal life. Well, thanks, Uday. So really appreciate uh, the time, and uh, you're you're special to me. So thanks for having me on on your show. Yep. Thanks for enjoying that podcast with me. I trust that you learned some very valuable information that will help you throughout the course of your career and your personal journey in ophthalmology and ocular surgery. Be sure to check out the podcast version as well. If you want to listen to this podcast while you're driving to work or working out at the gym, it's available on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever else you find your favorite podcasts. And I'll see you back in just a couple of weeks for the next edition of the Cataract Coach podcast series. Thank you.